Search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is 
now satisfied hearing your love. The God of the mountain He is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me chairs in front of you. There's a QR code, and that's going to be a big help to you today. If you'll let your phone take you there, it'll take you to the outline we'll be teaching from. It'll take you to the verses where we'll be studying. We'll have the verses and the outline on the screens. You can follow along that way, and then you're welcome to turn and follow along with the verses in your own scriptures as well. All right. Well, we've come a long way. We started with really trying to understand who God is. 
and we took the Trinity and we, we dealt with each member of the Trinity one at a time and tried to go in depth. I, this was my premise from the beginning, was not that you would just know what you believe, because most of you can fight your way through a conversation of what you believe. Most believers just don't know why they believe what they believe. So that's been our purpose as we've gone through here, so that you will be able to explain to your children, to your family, to your coworkers, your neighbors, this is what I believe and here's why. So last week was all about what happens when people die. And we talked about, remember the circles, we talked about the three parts of man, body, soul, and spirit. We drew a picture of what all that encompassed. We talked about who we really are is not our body. That's temporary, it's gonna die. But who we are is made up of our soul and inside of our soul is our spirit that when we're born is dead because we're born, we're conceived sinners. And our spirit is dead. And it's not until we surrender our life to Christ that he comes to live inside our spirit and quickens it, the Bible uses that word, or he makes it come alive, all right? And so then we talked all about what does it mean for a believer to die? Our body is temporary. There's gonna come a day in every one of our lives unless the Lord comes back before we die that each one of us, our bodies are gonna stop and we will face, we will face death either as a believer or as a non-believer. And last week we talked all about what is it like for a believer to go through death? What is death? Is it something that we need to be scared of? Is it something to get morbid and scary about? No, not at all. And we talked about what heaven is and what it's like. This week, we're gonna focus, May you might wanna just call it part two, but we're gonna look at the same thing from a little bit different angle. Not from the angle of a believer, but from the angle of someone who's not a believer. For whatever reason, and every non-believer has a list of reasons why they've never become a believer. You know, it's my family, it's my parents, it's my job, I was hurt at church. You know what? And in everybody's own mind, those reasons are very good for them, right? But I want you to understand that it's... <laughs> Every unbeliever is gonna go through the same experience, and we're gonna talk about that this morning. We talked last week, and we've talked several times before about the different research studies that are done. Pew does uh, some great research studies, and when you look at what they find, the number of believers, true believers, who say there's no such thing as hell, who say, you know what, this is one of their, their statements. Hell is a scare tactic that churches and pastors use to try to get you, to push you toward God. Well, that's not true. I mean, that's a great excuse. Is hell scary? Absolutely it is. I mean, Hollywood can't create a movie that depicts it well enough uh, you can't even in your wildest imagination dream of the horrors of what it all entails. It is a very scary thing for an unbeliever. But here's what, here's what you've got to think. Just because I don't like it and just because I don't believe in it, does it change the reality just the least little bit? Not at all, not at all. See, let's think, let's, we're just kind of talking here, right? What if there wasn't a hell? Let's approach it from that angle for just a minute. What if they're right and there's no such thing as hell? Now just think about the dominoes that that's gonna influence. If there's no heaven, if you can't believe that there is a hell, can there be a heaven? Hmm. 
If the Bible was lying about hell, how do you know it's not lying about heaven? You don't. If there's no hell, you have questioned the very authority of God's word. You can't believe anything in this book if you say that it was a lie about hell. Not only have you questioned the authority of God's word, but you've questioned the authority of the Lord Jesus himself because Jesus taught about hell. So you're shaking your fist in the face of God and you're saying, Jesus, you're a liar. Do you see the dominoes that keeps happening in all of this? Oh, folks, this is a big, big, big deal. If there wasn't a hell, then why did Jesus leave heaven? That's pretty dumb, wasn't it? Why would you leave the throne and the majesty and the glory and the worship of all of those millions and billions of angels? Why would you have had to come to earth and put up with what you went through to suffer like you did on the cross? For what? So you can be saved. Listen, saved from what? Well, if there's no hell, there's nothing to be saved from. If there's no hell, why do you need a gospel? If there's no hell, you're not going to heaven because everything's a lie. Do you see how it gets deeper and deeper and deeper? Let me ask you some questions like we've been doing the last several weeks and months. Uh, questions always help me remember the, the outline and help me study a little better. We touched on this last week. You know, I vary a little bit in all three services. So uh, if this was the service that I mentioned part of this, just pretend like you didn't hear it before and just smile and say amen every now and then and I'll think you're loving it. <laughs> but let me just ask you a question. Why did God create hell? Think about that. It wasn't for people because he created hell years and years and centuries and a long time before humans were ever thought of and ever created. In Isaiah 14, it goes into talking about a rebellion that took place in eternity past in heaven. There was a, a certain angel that guarded the throne of Almighty God. He was kind of the highest of all the angels in rank. His name was Lucifer. Scripture says he was the most beautiful of all the angels. Oh, it just goes on and brags about his gifts and talents. But you know what? Pride got into Lucifer. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of just standing here serving him. I'm going to take over. I'm going to be God and not him. And he led a third of the billions of angels to follow him. And there was a rebellion in heaven. And God took them and cast them out of heaven. And he created this place called hell. And he put some of them there immediately. Some of them he allowed to roam free. And the angels now are rebellious. The angels are now following these certain band of angels, are now followers of Satan and Lucifer. And so they're not known any longer as angels, but now they are demons that follow Satan. Hell was for them. Look what Scripture says. Look in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then he will say talking about God as he judges, then he will say to those on his left hand, the people who've never surrendered their life to him, the people who are not believers, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire that I prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not intended for man at all. No. No. 
but man and woman and our students and our senior citizens who've, who choose, I don't want to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to surrender my life to him. Now, I don't mind coming to church when it's, you know, when I don't have anything else planned. Now, I, don't mind, I don't mind singing the songs and listening. But you know what? I have no desire for God to change my life. See, there are a lot of people in church on a regular basis that are not believers. Just because you're here doesn't mean that you're a believer. We're going to find out in just a few minutes that when people stand before Almighty God, there are going to be a lot of people that are absolutely shocked and surprised when Jesus doesn't allow them to go to heaven. We're going to get into that a little bit more. But who did he, did he, um, how did I word it? Why did God create hell? It wasn't for you and it wasn't for me. It was for Satan and all of the angels that followed him, his demons. Wow. So then why are people there? Okay, that's a good question. Let's answer that in just a little bit. Let's talk for just a minute. Let's talk about the Lord. Did Jesus ever teach on hell? Can you remember a time where he did? Can you remember who he was talking to? Can you imagine or can you remember what he said about hell? He taught on hell more than any other prophet, more than any other rabbi to the Jewish people, more than any other person. He's taught and spoke about the warnings and the dangers and the description of hell. Matter of fact, in the Gospels, he spoke more about heaven, I mean more about hell than he did about heaven. Isn't that amazing? Over 70 times in the scriptures, Jesus spoke about hell. We lose sight of how much is said and, how, and all, that, all that he goes into about hell. Let's look at some verses in how hell is described by Jesus and some of the other writers. Again, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, just right down from where we were. And these, referring to the ones in verse 41, he said, these that are on my left, the ones that are not believers, right? The ones that are, uh, are gonna go into everlasting punishment. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, there are two really important words in this one verse it's the word describing hell as everlasting and the word describing life or heaven as eternal. Everlasting and eternal are interchangeable. And isn't it unique that he uses the same word, the same word to describe heaven as he does hell? See, now that lets you know right now all the, the doctrine that some of our other denominations have about a place that they call purgatory that's temporary, that's just kind of a holding bin. It's for you to get your act together if you're not a believer, for you kind of get a new attitude, for you to pay penance, right? To do a little bit of punishment, nothing bad, nothing hard, but just a little bit of punishment. And then they're gonna promote you and let you come to heaven. See, that gets real difficult to hold to that doctrine because the exact same word, eternal and everlasting, describes both heaven and hell. And if hell is temporary in any way, then what do we know about heaven? It's temporary as well. Well, if that's the case, when the temporariness ends, then what? Scripture never discusses that because it's not even uh, an issue. Look at another description in Luke chapter 16, verse 24. This is the, um, the, the story that Jesus told about. There was a rich man and there was a, a beggar that was laid at his door. And the, the rich man, you know, he lived really fine. He had a lot of money, a lot of nice things. The beggar was poor, but it's not about being rich or poor. It's not about being homeless or living in a mansion. It's about 
being surrendered to the Lord or just being so prideful and independent. He said, then he cried out, talking about the rich man. They both died and the beggar was escorted into heaven. The rich man opened his eyes in hell. All right. Further along in that parable, verse 24, it says, and then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. You know what? We, we don't like to think about hell. I, we, we don't like to think about it. We don't like to read about it. You don't like to hear it taught because it is frightful. And we do know, you know and I know, people that will probably end up going there. And I guess it's, maybe it's convicting for us as believers when we hear hell taught because I'm not more concerned that people I know are going to go there. Maybe I don't like to hear it because there's somebody in my family who's not a believer and I've not even brought up the conversation. I've made no attempt to share the gospel with them. It's almost as if they're going to hell and I don't care. But people don't like to hear about hell and the descriptions of it. Tormented, the pain, the suffering that goes along with torment. I'm tormented in this flame. We laugh at hell. The cartoons are about hell. All the little flames that they'll draw on the cartoon characters. Satan with a little pitchfork and a long pointed tail and horns right out here. Yeah, hell is a joke for a lot of people and a lot of things. You talk to people who aren't believers and they'll make fun of hell. Well, I can't wait to go to hell. You ever heard had somebody tell you that? I have many times. Yeah, who wants to go to heaven? Man, I don't want to be up there with all you hypocrites. I don't want to be up in heaven and just have to go to church for the rest of my life. Man, I want to go to hell. Hell's where the party is. Hell's where my friends are going to be. Hell's where we're going to do everything that's wrong and it's going to be so much fun. Really? Gosh, torment doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. Flames don't sound like a lot of fun to me. Just the, the unending torture of burning and never burning up. You know, we don't have time to go to all the verses that cover all these descriptions. Let's just walk through them. Isn't it amazing? Scripture talks about that it's outer darkness. I mean... You've been in dark places before, but have you been in places where you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face? Yeah. Think about this now. Think about even in hell, the miracle that is there. Because with all the fire, fire gives off two things. It gives off heat and light. Wouldn't you think that it would be very well lit with that much fire? But yet God says it's utter and outer darkness. What a miracle. For the next billion years, they're going to be confronted, even in hell, with the miracles of God. Scripture talks about the tears, the weeping, the gnashing of teeth. You know what gnashing is? It's when you grit your teeth so hard because something hurts so bad. You're just trying to, you're just trying to keep from just absolutely going crazy. The screams, the weeping, the smoke from all of the fire, not being able to get a good breath. You know, in the fall when you burn leaves, you ever noticed, doesn't matter what direction you're on in that fire, all of that thick, leafy smoke always goes right to you, right? And then you can't breathe and you're coughing. Can you imagine that for billions and billions of years? The loneliness. Oh, I'm going down there with all my friends. One, you can't see them. Two, they're screaming. They don't care about you. You're not going to think about them for a minute. But the loneliness of hell, you're going to be all by yourself as far as you're concerned. Can you think of that? all by yourself with the memories and the guilt 
and the shame of what it could have been, what you could have had, what like life could have been like. Oh, folks, hell is an absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible place. But you know what I think the worst characteristic of all is? Let's go back to the verse that we read previously, Matthew 25, back to 41. I think this verse contains the most worst horror of all. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, here it is, say it, depart from me. Can you imagine, and we can't, we can't, to be banished from the presence of Almighty God forever. God represents everything that is holy, everything that is righteous, everything that is intrinsically good, and to be banished. You'll never, you'll never get to see his face. You'll never get to hear his voice after that. That's the last you'll ever hear. Depart from me. I never knew you. You'll never get to enjoy his presence You'll never get to enjoy the relationship, the intimacy that's there, that closeness. The Bible uses the word fellowship, but just the joy of being so close to Almighty God. And you know, if you say that to somebody who's not a believer, you know what they instantly will say back to you? I don't care about that. You know what? Right now, that's probably a true statement. But there's coming a day when you'll desire it and you won't be able to have it. It is so absolutely horrible to be separated from God for all of eternity. No family, no friends, all alone in agony. Look at Matthew, I mean, at Hebrew chapters 9, verse 27. We talked about this last week too. It's appointed unto men... Uh, for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. See, there's no second chances. It's not like when you stand before God and you get to say, God, my bad. I was just too busy. Man, I was so involved with my family. I was just pouring my life into my work, my kids. There's no second chance. If you're not a believer, if you've not surrendered your life to him, after that, the judgment. I never knew you. Depart from me. But, 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 depart from me. I never knew you. One more verse. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Listen, last week I brought up a question. And this is what you hear. Well, you don't have to read very far in many articles. You don't have to talk to very many people. Somebody's going to ask you this. See, I just don't get it, Pastor. How can a loving God send somebody to hell? Right? Well, we, here's what we talked about last week. God has so many characteristics. Love is not his only one. See, you're saying that love is the only part of God there is, and you can't separate God's love from his holiness. You can't separate God's love from his justice. See, the holiness of God says that I am so holy and so righteous, I cannot stand to be in the presence of sin. I can't allow sin. I can't allow somebody who's not a believer into heaven with me because they're a sinner. And because they're a sinner, that's my holiness that refuses that. The justice of God says, I have to do what I've said that I would do. And scripture says that the wages of sin, the punishment of sin, the price of sin, the penalty, all of those are synonyms. The penalty that you have to pay because you're a sinner by birth, by nature, and you never surrendered your life to me. The wages of sin is not death, but that eternal separation from God, hell. 
You have to go to hell if you're not a believer. God can't make an exception for you and not you. And if he made one exception, he wouldn't be God because he couldn't be just. But because of God's holiness and because of the justice of God that says, I have to send a lost person to hell, now let's talk about the love of God. Because of God's love, he says, I'm going to make a way that you don't have to go to hell. I'm going to make a way for you to be forgiven. I'm going to make a way for you to be saved. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering, he's patient toward us, not willing that who should perish? Anybody, anybody. That's the love of God. The justice of God says that if you're not a believer, you have to be judged. Somebody's got to pay for your sins. And I'm not willing for you to go to hell. So I'm going to leave heaven. I'm coming to this earth. I'm going to be a man and I'm going to give my life as your sacrifice. My sinless blood is going to be there and it's going to make available for you forgiveness and salvation. I'm not willing that you should perish. Perish is the word that means eternal separation. It means hell. But that who should come to repentance? Oh, everybody. God wants you to be saved. Is God a loving God? Absolutely, that's why he came. But he's also a just God. And he's got to do what he said he would do. And he's also holy. Oh, folks, listen, for the person who's never surrendered their life to Almighty God, death is not something that they need to look forward to. Death is going to be the first of the most horrible eternity they could ever, ever dream of. Let me ask you one more question. Do only bad people go to hell? It's what a lot of people think. You know, I always talk about the answers you get in children's church. You know, if you went down there and, uh, and asked them about dying, they would tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, bad people go to hell. They don't say hell, they say. Or... My little grand, grandson said, Pop, you know where they go, A.T., uh, double hockey sticks. And um, you know what? Do only bad people go there and the good people get to go to heaven? This is what I want you to understand. Look what Matthew said in chapter 7. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's, it's not about what you say. It's not about coming to church. It's not about being good. It's about surrendering your life to Almighty God. 22, many, just a couple, just a handful, or just a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Folks, death is going to be a huge surprise for a lot of people that are regular in church. You can be the best person you can be. You can be the most loving parent or grandparent. You can have the greatest job. You can have the most money. You can have it made. And still go to hell. Because it's not about how loving or how good you are, how kind or involved you are in church. It's all about surrender. And the proof of surrender is life change. If you died this afternoon, would you spend eternity in heaven 
or would you spend eternity in hell? I can't answer that for you. Neither can you answer that for me. But in your own heart right now, where would you spend eternity? And if you don't know, and I, I've questioned it a lot, I'm not sure, probably not, or some of you may just be very open and say, you know what, I know I wouldn't go to heaven. You know what, more than anything, God wants you to be saved today. You need to be saved because hell is real. You need to be saved because God is a just God and somebody has to pay for your sins and you've chosen to pay your own penalty. You can be saved today if you'll give him your life. Pray with me. Father, Lord, um, thank you that you are such a loving God. But thank you, Father, for being holy, for being sinless, for being righteous, for being pure, for being just. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you came to this earth as a man so that you could make salvation and forgiveness available to us. And Father, I pray for the people in this room right now who've never surrendered their lives to you. Father, people in this room that uh, just are not sure, people in this room that suffer with doubts, people that just don't have that proof in their hearts. God, I pray that they could understand more than anything how much you want to save them today. And I pray that right now they would call out to you in the privacy of their heart, God, I need you. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me and making salvation available. Thank you, Father, that I can be saved right now. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord right now. Father, I pray all over this room for people to be honest and real with you. And I thank you for the people that prayed that prayer. I thank you for the people that surrendered their life to you right now. Lord, we love you so much. Speak to our hearts. Challenge our hearts. Change our hearts. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand together, can we?